I, I like the market to tell me rather than me tell the market. But it, it just appears to me that, you know, as long as these central banks around the world are happy to continue to provide liquidity, then it's going to be very hard for assets to go down. You have all these stock markets at or very close to all-time highs. You have gold and silver um, going up a lot, you know. Um, so to me, as long as there is liquidity out there, the market's going to have a hard time going down. We know that the metals have gone up a lot recently. People are getting pretty excited about it. It was getting pretty close to crowded a couple weeks ago. Um, but surprisingly, it was getting even more closer to crowded a month ago, and they've sold into the rally. So it's gotten less crowded, which is what I think has given it juice to continue. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course <laughs> your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to introducing a first time guest to, to our audience. It's Jason Shapiro. He's the editor, author and host of the Crowded Market Report. And uh, somebody I've been looking forward to interviewing for a while now because uh, he has a bit of a different, different approach to investing. It's a bit of a technical approach. And uh, we're going to discuss some, some ma market themes. We're going to talk about how crowded is the gold trade right now should we buying the s p 500 how, how is that looking and of course we're going to discuss the economy overall what are, what are his trading setups what is he looking for and where does he see opportunity and uh, where's where, where are some areas that other traders are not looking where is where's the crowd not yet and uh, where is it going to go so really looking forward to this but before i switch over to my guest hit that like and subscribe button it's a free way to support our channel and we tremendously appreciate it thank you so much now jason it is great to have you on the program thank you so much for joining me here on soar financially thanks for having me yeah really looking forward to the next uh, you know 40 minutes here with you and maybe we'll start with a bit of an introduction what is the crowded market report you're the first time guest on the channel i think we have to explain it a little bit and explain your philosophy so crowded market report was born out of the fact that um, i've been a money manager for a long time going on three decades i was featured in um I don't know if I was featured. I was included in Jack Schwager's latest Market Wizards book. And um, when I was, I had a lot of people contact me asking me, you know, hey, they like my chapter. Could I teach them what I do? And, you know, could they come work for me? Could they do this? And, um, you know, they caught me at a pretty good time because I am at the age now where I am sort of looking to get out and pass along what I have learned, which was done to me. Um, so I didn't really know how to do it because there were so many people that had hit me up. Um, it's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> One of those people I said that to said, well, why don't I start a web page and you could centralize it and people could join. And, and that's what we did. That's what Crowded Market Report became. I had no idea at the time what it was going to become. But he uh, did a lot of things that I never could have done. A Discord on there, which I didn't even know what Discord was at the time. And, you know, we do a newsletter uh, that goes every week, which is something I've written for myself for the last 25 years. That goes out. We're on the Discord. We do, you know, videos on YouTube that are all free. And we have conversations on there on Friday night. And on Sunday night, we do conversations with all the members. We do a whole bunch of stuff. We're really just trying to help people to understand, I think, um, how the market actually works, as opposed to a lot of the stuff that's out there that is giving them bad information on how, in my opinion, how the market works. Maybe the market doesn't work the way that I think, but it's a different way of looking at how the market works, and it has worked for me. So hopefully that can help people add to their arsenal as they're trying to make money doing this. Yeah. Can you explain your trading style a little bit? It's a bit of a contrarian approach. Can you just like explain like because because I've, I've listened to a couple of your other interviews that you've done on other channels that we highly recommend, and um, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand like the crowded market report, like crowded market, like like what what's the definition of that? So, for me, um, when we try to develop an edge in the market, we have to understand the market's a discounting mechanism. Um, so therefore, theoretically, it. The price is discounting every piece of known information out there. So how are you going to get an edge if that's even remotely true? Um, I personally believe that the discounting mechanism in the market is participation and not price. So when people say, oh, this thing is, is has gone too far, they're usually looking at price. You know, hey, this stock has doubled. It's gone too far. Or this asset's gone up a lot. It's gone too far. Therefore, it's time to go the other way. I don't look at it like that. 
um, I look at it as participation. So the way I see it is participants are way too long this thing here, so it's time to go the other way. Or participants are way too short this thing here, so it's time to go the other way. Um, so that's why I look at it for crowded markets. Um, how I do that is I use obviously data like the commitments of traders report, um, which is data given on the U.S. futures markets. And then I pay attention to a lot of what people are talking about. And I'm looking for consensus and I'm looking for the positioning to match the consensus. And that tells me the market is super crowded. And at that point, I'm looking to, to go the other way. Do you look at Google Trends at all? I don't. We do Just have curious, people. Like... You know, it's been interesting. <laughs> the Discord thing has been interesting because we've had a lot of people join. And they do look at, you know, I am old and, and <laughs> I'm a boomer kind of thing, you know. Um, but we do have a lot of younger people on there that have a much better skill set than I do at that. And they start to look at stuff like that and they post it on there. And it's really been a, a great help. I always say I've probably I've learned more from this whole experience than I, I probably have taught. No, fantastic. I really appreciate the introduction to, you know, the crowded market report and yourself, of course. But uh, let, let's start at the beginning of the conversation. We usually start with uh, uh, Jason, and that is sort of your your evaluation of, of, of the current market environment. Like, where, where are we at? How healthy is the current market? How do you rate things right now? You know, uh, on a macro level, basically, I and I build my macro stuff, I look at the positioning and then I back into the macro as opposed to most people who will build their macro, right? And then try to trade the market around that. I, I like the market to tell me rather than me tell the market. But it, it just appears to me that, you know, as long as these central banks around the world are happy to continue to provide liquidity, then it's going to be very hard for assets to go down, you know? The whole thing, macro to me, is liquidity, right? Um, and liquidity is growing. And it's hard to measure that sometimes because you get like the M2 number and all that. But then you have, you know, um, how many times that turns over, the velocity of money supply, which we can't measure until after the fact. But the markets are telling us clearly that uh, there's no liquidity issue. You have all these stock markets at or very close to all-time highs. You have gold and silver. Um going up a lot you know um so to me as long as there is liquidity out there the market's gonna have a hard time going down you know and liquidity does change very quickly you know i, I worked at a, a large hedge fund when everything went went sour um in 08 and the people who were bearish had been bearish for a while and i can specifically remember sitting in a meeting and one of the guys was like look i want to be bearish but there's just too much liquidity out there and that ended up being the top. He gave up at the top there. And I, you know, four months later, we went from this too much liquidity out there to there's absolutely no liquidity out there, right? So it can change very quickly, but the markets will show you first um, if that is happening. And I see no evidence of that happening as of now. No. We had Michael Howell on just last week, and I'm sure you're familiar with his work over at Cross Border Capital, but uh, he, he was showing a chart that it pretty much liquidity moves in sinus waves. And uh, we're just on an uptrend. So liquidity is actually increasing. And that sort of exactly like fits your narrative as well. There's no shortage of liquidity. It's actually increasing. Stimuluses are happening. Quantitative tightening is, is not tight <laughs> um, per, per se, right? So um, let, let's dig a little deeper in that, uh, on, on that as well. But uh, I was wondering, I wrote a question down and uh, I'm going to throw it in now because you said the market is telling me where to go. Um, are you worried about missing um, out on, th on on potential gains because it seems like you're more reactionary and uh, I'm trying to phrase a question that makes sense to me as well like are you worried about missing out on gains when when you're just reacting to the market instead of building a thesis uh, and then maybe being ahead of a market you know I trade a very specific process and what my process does is it, it, it actually picks turns so I'm not I'm not uh behind the market you know <laughs> when i get a trade right I, I get it pretty close to the exact turn having said that i get a lot of trades wrong i'll pick the turn i'll get stopped out you know um but no i'm not worried about mi missing trades or anything like that i you know this is different than my macro and all that view that's all just a view and it's great to talk about but i, I trade a very specific process right yeah. which is when things get massively crowded short and then the market confirms for me that it's done going down I get long and when things get massively crowded long and the market confirms for me that it, it's done going up, I, I get short. That, that, that's all I do. The rest of it is all just interesting conversation, so to speak. Right. 
I can sometimes get some nice macro views based on that. But like I say, it's it's backing into the macro view based on what I'm seeing, where the crowdedness is. You know, if I see everybody's crowded long bonds, then I believe bonds are going to go down. And I can build a macro view based on that view that bonds are probably going to go down. Plus, you're mixing them with some of the other markets as well. And you can sort of build this macro view. Gotcha. Like maybe just an oversimplified question, but where is the crowd right now? What markets are they trading and where is it maybe even almost overcrowded? It's getting close in the metals, although it hasn't gotten there yet. Right. I mean, we know that the metals have gone up a lot recently. People are getting pretty excited about it. It was getting pretty close to crowded a couple of weeks ago. Um, but surprisingly, it was getting even more closer to crowded a month ago. And they've sold into the rally. So it's gotten less crowded, which is what I think has given it juice to continue. The data comes out on Friday. It'll be interesting to see um, what has happened in the last week or so. Um, but they're certainly getting sort of crowded in the metals, um, although not there yet. And you have to remember, just because a market is crowded doesn't mean it can't continue, right? It just, to me, just shifts the risk reward, right? Um, and I don't short a crowded market just because it's crowded. You know, I need the market to kind of confirm the idea first, right? Um, and even then, it's crowded, it confirms, it still doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it just means the risk reward is great. You know, I, I make money on less than half my trades, but um, when I make, because it's so crowded, if it starts to make and all these people have to get stopped out, I make a lot. And if I lose, you know, I get short something, it takes out a new high, I get stopped out, I lose, you know, one. And when I make, you know, I'll make like five or six and um, depends where you want to go with the conversation. But that to me is what trading is. No. Trading is not about predicting the future and all that stuff. Trading is about getting into situations where you can make five and lose one, make five, lose one, make five, lose one. And you want to consistently do that. And trading against massively crowded markets is what I have found to be the best way to do that. You, you mentioned the COT reports and that's an interesting uh topic because we barely discuss this here on this channel if for some reason it never comes up i'm not an expert on the cot that's a commitment to traders report by the way that comes out once a week um what what does it look like right now and uh, or what has it looked like and uh, what, what do you expect um it to say maybe tomorrow and it's a bit of an unfair question because it's uh it means you have to get your crystal ball out but i'm curious um what has it looked like who, who, who's short like what, what's the size of the short and long contracts here for for gold and silver in particular right now since you brought up the so i put it like on a percentage basis so when it gets above 95%, I consider that to be crowded enough that I'll be looking to go the other way. Gold and silver have been somewhere around the 80% range for the last few weeks. So they've got a ways to go. Now that can move very quickly in a week. Do I expect that it would have moved quickly uh, this past week? I, I kind of do. Um, we'll see when it comes out. Um, but certainly the silver thing, I think, uh, is probably going to be crowded. Platinum was also very, very close last week. Uh, so that might be there as well. Um, that's where really where I see uh, the most crowded positions here. Interesting. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm curious. I've just had a conversation with a friend of mine and uh, he invited me on his podcast, Trevor Hall on Mining Stock Daily. And we were talking about whether gold, for example, is, is overbought and uh, the mining stocks in, in particular. But uh, I said maybe gold, but the mining stocks are far from it. And uh, do do you look at stocks as well, like or indices like the GDX, GDXJ, or so? Um, do do you follow that, uh, or do you stay more on the macro level? No, I, I follow it just because I sit here all day. I'm watching everything. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what overbought means. I, I'm not that kind of trader. You know, these technical signals of overbought and over RSI or whatever you're using for that. Yeah, I I don't think that for me that they don't really add value. Sure markets will get overbought and that's what they were top, but markets can get overbought and stay overbought and keep going up for a very long time as well. So using that as your indicator has not been to me. A yeah. great thing. No, um, interesting. Like, so, sorry, Jeff, it's like when you say crowded, right? I always think like everybody's in the deal. Like everybody's like my cab drivers talking about gold and mining stocks and like everybody, right. Is, is in the deal. And it feels like in gold and, and silver to a degree, like, you said we were close, but I think we're still far away from my cab driver talking about gold right now, for example. Is uh, like, how, how do you measure that? Like, it feels like the generalists are not paying attention and the miners in particular, but uh, 
we're, we're missing a lot a big portion of the market is not even looking at gold or mining stocks like w would you agree and uh, i'm trying to make sense of the the, the crowd i think that that's changed that in the last couple of weeks I, I, you're starting to get a lot more chirping going on about that stuff you know is the shoe shine boy talking about it <laughs> i don't really know <laughs> I, you know I, I listen to the tv i listen to the bloomberg tv and the cnbc and um there was not a lot of talk about that stuff but in the last two weeks certainly uh it, it's picking up there's no question now has it gotten to where it's maximum crazy? Probably not. Um, but it, it's definitely picking up. I mean, when a market moves the way that it's moved, you know, that, that's going to pick up, right? But more important than the talk is the actual positioning, which is why the COT is so valuable. Yeah. Um, we, talk we, we about just... it's one thing, you know, to actually yeah. have your money in it is another. Exactly. No, it, it's interesting. Like, I, I kind of like the terminology. <laughs> it's interesting to wrap my head around. Um, I want to talk macro shocks to to degree. Um, right now, we've we've had the BRICS meeting in in, in Russia this week, uh, which is a big macro event. Of course, everybody was expect or a lot of investors were expecting maybe there's a gold backed currency announced or so. But my question more is like, how do you factor those uh, macro events into your trading, and uh, how how does it, how is it reflected? I don't. I let everybody else factor it in. When it's over factored in, you know via the positioning that's when i'm looking to go the other way right um i'm not going to put on a trade because i think oh this macro event could happen or this macro event could I, I have no ability to predict the future um so therefore i don't trade based on my ability to pick to pick the future i have to go where where i find an edge and and, and the positioning is where i found an edge so has everybody else discounted in this idea right i mean that's what i do once i see the a, a market is super crowded I'm really looking into a why is it so super crowded? What are they thinking about, right? And then when I go the other way is when they get what they want and the market then fails to rally on that. So if everybody were getting long gold, let's say, because they believe that there was going to be some global gold backed currency, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and they got super, super long gold and I was looking to go the other way. And then they announced there's going to be this gold backed currency and gold didn't go up on that. Right, that's when I would look to get short it. It's like a sell the news event type of thing, which is a pretty classic uh, trading thing. But sell the news event when everybody is already in it because there's nobody left to buy it is the theory. Reminds me a bit of uh, the day the Fed announced rate cuts. And uh, it's sort of the market didn't do what I thought it might do, meaning it, it goes, uh, it, it drop. And uh, the only thing I see drop really that day was bonds, but not the market like I expected. Maybe cause especially by uh, the the move that the Fed has done, like fifty basis points. Not everybody had that on their radar, so I was a bit surprised that like the S and P didn't drop. It actually rallied, and uh, the only market that dropped, as I said, were, were bonds. Were Were you surprised at all by that reaction? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the stock market is in a bull market. Okay. There's way too many bears relative to where the stock market is, okay? I'm not saying everybody's bearish, but I'm saying that there's way too many bears relative to the market essentially being on an all-time high. So uh, I'm not surprised when the stock market goes up. Is it overvalued? Is it this? Is it that? We can have that argument all day long. But the, to me, how I look at it, people are not super crowded along the stock market here, so it keeps going up. The bond market, I think, um, with the Fed stuff is the most misunderstood thing that I, I almost I've, I've ever seen. Um, you know, these people are cutting rates and, and they cut rates more than was expected in a world where assets are on all time highs. So clearly there's no liquidity issue. So what are they doing? I don't know. But that is clearly going to be, at least in my view, and, and what I've been talking about for six months, that should be bearish bonds. You know, the short end, it gets somewhat anchored to what the Fed does. You know, obviously the Fed funds is, is anchored directly to what the Fed does. But the longer end has nothing to do with that. The long end has to do with future inflation and growth expectations. And if they're cutting rates aggressively into a world where assets are on all time highs, then future inflation expectations have got to go through the roof and, and therefore long end of, of, of the curve should go down. And, and that's what did happen. And that is what's happening. And, and if there's anything to me um, that's going to stop this asset stuff going up, 
it's when people finally get that and come and, and they're starting to, I think, but um, come to that conclusion, you know, like I kept hearing, I, I was writing so much and, and doing videos so much about this because I kept hearing people like Congress would be talking to, to, to the Fed chair and be like, when are you going to cut rates? So mortgage rates can come down so people can afford housing. Well, him cutting rates doesn't mean mortgage rates are going to go down. Right. Him cutting rates when he theoretically shouldn't be means mortgage rates are going to go up. Right. Because future inflation expectations are going to go up, which is exactly what they've done. Right. And not just future inflation expectations, but all these inflation assets like gold and all these things that have gone up. So I think that's the most misunderstood for whatever. It's a pretty basic thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the most misunderstood thing out there right now. And should bonds continue to go down? Um eventually people are going to get it, you know? Um, and once they get it, they will start to sell these assets and be like, Oh my God, you know, but, um, and I tell you, it will coincidentally or not be right when they get most crowded long is when that will turn around. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but you know, let, let's see. I'm, I'm curious, like we've, we've had almost four weeks now to digest the fed rate cut. And, uh, it seemed like the most, important reason for for the fed to lower rates was the unemployment or the the, the employment market the job market right um i'm, I'm curious like 50 basis points signals more than uh ju just a bit of a signal it's, it's it's a bigger move than than everybody expected and i'm trying to like sort of understand like where are we going from here and uh, based on your reasonings like why did they even lower rates like what data did they use and like wh how did they justify it and I, how do I, you justify it for them <laughs> I'm not on the Fed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they're thinking, um, but I, I believe, from what I understand, the thinking is that if you look at Fed funds, you know, relative to inflation, it, it, it's a lot higher. If inflation is two and a half percent, Fed funds is five or whatever, right? There's room to to cut there. I think that was their their thing, right? Um, so that's what they did, you know. Uh, I think that was what it was, but I have been saying, and I'm not one of these people that thinks oh, all that, that's a fed hater and always is saying, oh, the fed is wrong and the fed is stupid and blah, blah, blah. But I, I've been saying for many months that I, I think they're insane to be cutting rates here personally. I, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. But if that, I, I don't care either. If that's what they're going to do. Well, <laughs> I have to make money. You know what I mean? It's not about what, what I think, you know what I mean? It's about making money in the markets. I'm a, I'm a money manager, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not a writer of macro research or something like that. You know, it doesn't have to make sense to me. I have to make money in the markets one way or the other, you know, so let them do what they want to do. But I, I personally think it's, it's insane. And, and that could end up being wrong. Maybe we go into some big slowdown and, and they were right the whole time. I don't know, but I don't see any signs of that. You know, everywhere I go, people laugh at me and it, this is my whole analysis, but Every time I go out to dinner, all the restaurants are full. Every time I go to an airport, you know, the lines are backed up. Like you've got, you know, college football players getting paid a half a million dollars a year to, 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 to attend the college, you know, no. and that's not like the superstars. It's like just what used to be called a recruit. You know, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't seem like there's a shortage of money out there to me, you know, call me crazy. I know these are just a few <laughs> examples and people say, oh, but that's because, you know, the poor people are suffering and, you know, you don't see that. And that may very well be, but the poor people are always suffering financially relative to rich people. So that's that's nothing new, right? No, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, I love listening to 50s and 60s, like, crime plays from the BBC or so, or even German crime audio plays. And uh, the thematics and the themes are always the same. That's Government right. sucks, unemployment, and that's the economy is right. terrible, right? That's like, right. oh, and, we can't afford and, the, the, this economy. Don't forget, don't forget the deficit. Yeah. Well, the deficit back in the 60s wasn't a topic, but uh, well, it was like those three, right? Um, and it, it, it's interesting. Like, it always repeats. Like, people always need to be negative, negative. or have a focused enemy, right? And maybe it's also my German attitude. Um, we're always negative. We're always looking for the downside. We never trust in the upside. So let's <laughs> turn this conversation around a little bit. Like, what are some of the positive signals that you see um, that could help continue the rally let's let's talk in the main markets here um that that emphasize a positive momentum here liquidity what happens and again this is something that i couldn't tell you okay i'm lucky that i can even get on this computer and and, and, and talk with you all right but what if this ai thing is real 
right? What what if the big boost that everybody's going to get for productivity is real in AI? And that's going to flow through to all these companies and there's going to be this whole big productivity boost. I would have to think that's a positive, right? If people are, are, are making more money out of a dollar of revenue because they're, they're much more productive, that, that's got to be a positive. And that could be an explanation for why the PEs are, are higher than they have been historically because the market is forward looking. So, you know, maybe what it's forward looking at is the idea that we're about to get a whole hell of a lot more productive than we ever have been. There are certainly some people out there who are a lot smarter than I, who are a lot richer than I, who are a lot more successful than I, and who have a lot more say in what the future is going to look like than I, that are investing a hell of a lot of money in that stuff, right? So who are you going to believe? You know, I don't know. The analyst who's been bearish NVIDIA because it's been overbought for a year and a half or the people that run, you know, Google and Microsoft and, and Facebook and whatever who are investing billions and billions of dollars into this stuff. You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Like I say, I, I don't believe anybody. I just try to make money. But okay. if you're going to ask me what's the argument that this can continue, I would certainly think that that is the argument. You know, and everybody wants to compare this to the bubble of 1999. And I was trading during the bubble of 1999. And whether or not the market tops right here, right now, I can assure you this is not the same the bubble of 1999. You want to talk about, you know, your taxi driver and your shoeshine boy talking about the markets every single day. That was the bubble of 99. Like, literally, that's how that looked. Um, and me, of course... I was trying to short that and I got run over. Okay. Um, the whole second half of 99, I kept saying, this is a bubble. This is a bubble. And this was before I used COT reports um, to really measure what the positioning was. Um, and so as someone who was going out there and saying, oh, this is a bubble, this is a bubble. I can tell you, nobody agreed with me. Everybody told me I was insane. I didn't know what I was talking about, which has <laughs> turned out they were right for about six months there. Um, but this is not that. Okay, I, I still listen to more bears than bulls on, on, on almost a daily basis. Right. And, you know, there were some statistics out there that show, oh, well, look at the net worth of, of people and how much is tied up in the stock market. It, it's high relative to history. And that's true, I would bet. But that's because the stock market's gone up so much in the last two years. Right. Um, I know because I speak with my wealth manager and I have friends that are in the wealth management business. They consistently tell me that their clients are sitting on much more cash than they, they ever have and have been ever since really the whole 2022 fiasco. Um, that took a lot of people out and they haven't been able to get back in because it's just run away from them and they're scared and the election and all these things that people like to get all the politics. You know, what I mean, you have like two groups, right? People who think that Trump is crazy are like, I would never invest my money if that guy's going to be president. And the people who think that, you know, Harris is crazy. I would never invest my money if that woman's going to be president. You know what I mean? So um, this is not 99. And that doesn't mean this can't be something different. And we talk for some other reason, right? Let's say AI becomes, is actually complete horse manure, right? And all this money's been invested for no reason. And it's all just a scam and all that. Okay, well, then the market can go down on that. But <laughs> All, all I'm saying is from a psychology point of view, which is how I like to look at things in a positioning point of view, this is is not 99. No, very interesting. Like you, a couple of questions popped into my head when you brought up AI and productivity increase, because I keep trying to figure out like, where is this all going to go? And I'm trying to find a solution for the debt problem the US have has. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to fix the world here, but I, I can definitely think about it. And um, an increase in productivity should have an increase in GDP with it. Right. In, in general, that's what that means. That's part of that equation. So I'm, I'm curious, like, is it is that increase in productivity? It's a very theoretical question, by the way, Jason, is um, that, that that increase in productivity, will that help keep the U.S. afloat? And will that avert the the the, the crash, like the debt bubble bursting that a lot of people are predicting? It could, you know, there's nothing like growth to solve a debt problem. You know, um, and I personally don't even think it matters because they're not going to give it up. This is the people that say that. And I have voiced this opinion on many an occasion. Um, see this debt bubble. 
it's a Ponzi scheme, right? These people own the printing machines. They can print as much money as they want. It's a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes end when the Ponzi runs out of money. These people don't run out of money. You know, they own the printing press. So <laughs> when do they run out of money? Well, you run out when the world stops accepting that money, right? So when the world stops accepting U.S. dollars because they have printed too many of them, well, then you can kiss it all goodbye. You know what I mean? You better be have all your net worth in Bitcoin or something like that, right? When that when that day happens, right? Um, do I believe that day is going to happen? Yes, because I think they are now backed into a corner where they have no other choice. You know, you look at the election. No one's talking about cutting rates or, or cutting tax or, or raising taxes. No one's talking about lowering spending. They're they're on heroin. political suicide, right? Exactly. They're all on heroin, right? They love it. They love the spending. They love the printing. They love it all. And they're not going to stop. And I think they've gone down the rabbit hole too far that there ain't no turning back, right? Especially with the way the political situation is now. It's all so tight, right? Are you going to be the politician or are you going to be the party that's going to run on? We're going to raise taxes because we want to shore up the fiscal situation. You're gone. You know what I mean? You ain't going to win. That might be a good idea, but you ain't going to win. Okay. So you can't do it. You know, ever since this 08, 09 thing, this has been the message, right? And we just saw it in China. They did it. They were having problems. What did they do? Flood the market. Open it up. You know what I mean? And this is what everybody does. And until that fails, it's going to work. You know, the Ponzi continues until it fails. And we'll know when it fails because the markets will again tell us, right? They will do some printing. They will do some whatever it is. And the markets will say no, right? That's supposed to be positive to the market and the market will go up and then it will go down and it'll be like, no, we're not taking it anymore. It's already sort of showing up in the bond market, right? Like you say, they cut rates, yet rates go up. And it's not just the 30 years where rates went up either. The short end rates have gone up too, right? So they're kind of saying it in the bond market already. I feel like that's getting a little bit in the market now. No one has really uh, seen that since the Fed cut. But now it is. We had a thing from Druckenmiller last week. We had a thing from Tudor Jones this week that, that we're talking about this very stuff. And now, so it, it's kind of getting in there now, right? A hell of a lot more than it was. Um, that's not going to change where it's going to be in six months to a year, but it might change the trade from here, you know, for a couple more months or a couple months or something. But so the market will tell us when that day occurs. And that day may occur tomorrow. That day may occur in a year. That day may occur in 20 years or, or it could be 40 years. We don't know. You know, people were talking about, including Paul Tudor Jones. And look, all due respect to Paul Tudor Jones. The guy's been a phenomenal money manager and has made an incredible amount of money and has given a lot back. And he's a great guy. OK, <laughs> but you can read the first Market Wizards book that he was in. And a big portion of his thing was him talking about how. The debt was too high, the deficit was too high, and it's going to stump economic growth and yada, yada, yada. Now, he didn't lose a dime off of that idea because he's a trader, right? And he knows it. He'll make money one way or the other. But when, the, you know, you, you, people have been talking about and, and I had an interview a couple of weeks ago where I mentioned this, and somebody told me that the person I was talking to was like 80-something years old. He said the same thing was true when he started in the 60s. They were talking about the same thing, right? So... You know, these things are good for markets if they keep doing this, you know, until they're not right until the Ponzi ends. So I wish I knew when that was. I don't know when that is. Right. Um, and like you say, maybe it goes away. Maybe they grow their way out of it and do all that. Sometimes I think about like, well, what happens if the U.S. government has to pay back? I don't know. Don't they own like tons of land? The U.S. government owns like a good percentage of the land in this country, right? Maybe they could sell that off. I mean, they have assets. I think about like me or anybody else. If you have debt and, and you got to pay it down, you, you have to sell your assets. I would think that the U.S. government actually has a hell of a lot of assets somewhere, right? They got oil underneath the ground. I mean, you know, um, there could be something they could do in those terms, too, if it ever got that bad, right? Revalue gold reserves. Something. You know what I mean? Something. There's something you can do, I would think. It's not like they don't have any assets that aren't necessarily on the book. I don't think however many millions of acres that the U.S. government owns of U.S. land is probably not on their balance sheet, I wouldn't think. I don't know. But, you know, um, again, these are just ideas. But 
like, by the time that happens, you, you ain't going to be worrying about it anyway. When the U.S. government can't make their obligations anymore and they've printed way too many dollars that nobody's going to accept dollars anymore, you know, we got a hell of a lot more bigger problems than where the S&P is going. You know what I mean? <laughs> and truthfully, when that happened in Germany, in the Weimar Republic, the German stock market went straight up. When that happened in Argentina two years ago, the Argentina stock market went straight up. Why is that? I don't know, but maybe it's because people are like, well, these dollars I'm holding are useless, so I have to put them in something. You know, why don't, why don't I put them into Apple stock, which is a real asset that sells real things and makes real money, you know? Maybe that's the, the thought process. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be bearish stocks as my first place in that world i would be bearish the hell out of bonds in that world i would be maybe bearish the hell out of currencies um which again means gold means bitcoin means that whole thing right but to spend your whole life playing that game is silly (laughs) you know build your bunker and fill it with food and guns and load up on bitcoin you know what i mean like where has that gotten you up to now And we've heard this argument, like you say, forever. It's longer than just the 50s. It's probably 2,000 years we've heard this argument, right? People have this this way of being, right? So It it is one of my biggest fears, I have to admit, Jason. Like, we've been predicting something back in 2008, 2009. Like, the market, we flooded it with cash. We were printing money. And I was wondering, like, where is this going to go? But I've been wrong for 10 years, at least, right? Um, about it as well, because I thought it's like, this is not sustainable. This doesn't make any sense. We can't just create money out of thin air, but we can. And uh, we you obviously think can. That somewhere along the way, the laws of economics and the laws but, of physics will come back to get you. Yeah, right. that's what I'm basing it on. But uh, as well, as oh, wait, oh, nine, though, we were in such a bad, this is my thought process. We were in such a bad situation that you weren't really going to catch huge inflation then because we were, everything was was collapsing right but that's what i'm saying like now we're not in that situation now we're on highs on all these assets and yet they're still doing it right Mm -hmm. so there you can get the inflation right and and i think you will and you have look the whole money printing has has caused inflation as we have seen now it's come down because the whole covert thing has come down but it 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 can definitely happen there's no (laughs) two ways about it from here is a lot different than 0809 to me right um, yeah. you'd have to believe at some point that the, the laws of science, whatever science that be, be it economics, be it physics, right? I mean, physics teaches us there's a limit to everything, including how much money the U.S. government can print, right? But until the markets tell you, you know, fighting it, you know, you're fighting City Hall. You're fighting the biggest City Hall in the history of mankind. So, yeah. you know, let the markets tell you first. The markets will speak loudly. They're starting to in bonds, like I said. Um, although today, obviously, we're having a pretty nice rebound, but um, the markets will speak loudly when the time comes. You, you'll, you, you'll know it because the markets will tell you. No. Jason, we covered a lot of ground already, but I have one last question. Over the summer, we've talked about the Trump trade and uh, the markets were going up or certain sectors were going up for, for various reasons. And it feels like that Trump trade is back on right now. Trump is in the lead. Um, and I'm curious, like, and I don't want to get political, but I want to talk politics because we've touched on it a couple of times in our conversation here. Like, what is the market pricing in right now? And where do you see things headed in, in, in two weeks? I don't really know what the market's pricing in. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Trump took the lead a couple of weeks ago. It's particularly in the betting markets, which I have no inside information on, but those can't be very big or very deep or very hard to manipulate. Let's just put it that way, right? Um, how much would it take to manipulate the betting markets? Probably not very much, and I'm sure Elon Musk could afford it. And I don't mean that as a, as a dig. I happen to love Elon Musk in a lot of ways. But um, so, but in theory, that's really what, what did this whole Trump thing. Everybody started believing Trump was taking lead because the betting market's first. If you really look at the polls, it looks like it's even. I don't know who's going to win. I have no clue. I'm a believer that it doesn't matter. I'm a believer that the market's going to go where it's going to go. Um, the path, okay, can be changed a little bit. I have been focusing on the fact that the last time that Trump won, um, the stock market went into like a mini crash that night because uh, everyone was so scared of, of, of Donald Trump, you know. Um, 
And by the time we opened the next morning, that whole mini crash was erased and the market was flat. And by the time it closed that day, the market was up a lot and we never looked back. Okay. So this time, you know, I'm a big believer that people love to trade last time what they wish they trade this time what they wish they did last time, but they didn't. Right. So I think that um, they won't sell it if Trump wins this time. Right. They'll probably buy it. Um, and maybe then you sell it to them, just like you should have bought it from them when they sold it. You know, I, I don't know. We'll see how that how, how the positioning looks and we'll see how the how the market trades on the back of that. But um, I, I don't really believe I look, I, I'm such a political cynic. Anyway, I don't even think these people have very much to do with any of the decisions that are made anyway. You know, I read a great thing that says, you know, the uh, politics is uh, the entertainment division of, uh, of the intelligence community. Um, <laughs> that's the world I know. That's where I believe, you know, I'm very about this stuff. So and, and the other problem is they're, they're, they're saying, oh, well, this is good. What Trump is saying about tariffs and what Trump is saying about taxes and what Trump is saying about this and that is good or bad or whatever. But we all know 99% of the things they talk about during the election never happen anyway. So, like, it's also silly to me, right? <laughs> we have no idea what they're going to do. I mean, these people talk, talk, talk because they're trying to get votes. They're, they're going out there and trying to figure out what's going to get them votes. And that's what they're saying. You saw Harris, she's changed her mind on a number of different things. And then people are like, oh, why would you change your mind? Well, why the fuck do you think I would change my mind? <laughs> because I want to get votes. Like, that's what the game is, right? The game is getting votes. Otherwise, you're irrelevant. If you don't win the election, you're irrelevant, right? So what they say to get votes is totally different to what actually gets done, right? And it's not even what gets done. These aren't dictators, what they want to get done, whether tax policy or trade, po you know, for the most part, it has to get voted through Congress. <laughs> so to me, the whole the whole thing is just narrative. And, and it's silly. Uh, personally, I, I think it's just silly, right? How are you going to predict a who's going to win B what they're actually going to get done anyway? See how the market's going to react to those. You have to there's so many moving pieces that you have to predict. It's just silly. You know, like I always say, predicting the future is, is it doesn't work. Nostradamus was not real. You know what I mean? Like you, you're not going to make money in this game predicting the future better than you have to predict the future better than the whole world is predicting it right now, because that's what's in the price of these assets is what the whole world is predicting. So are you going to over time do a better job of predicting that? Hey, I'm sure your ego tells you that you can, <laughs> but I think your P&L over time, if that's the way you play this game, will tell you that you can't. And you'll have to find a, a different way to make money doing this. No, I appreciate that. Let's let, let's leave our audience with, uh, I wouldn't say something actionable, but uh, maybe, and it's f not financial advice or anything. Like everybody's financial situation is different, but uh, where where is still room for the crowd to grow bigger, if that makes sense? Where where what, what trading room, what asset room still has room for a bigger crowd? Like, does that question make sense, Jason? I mean, the long stock trade still has room. It still no. has plenty of room. For, for it to get super crowded, right? I think that what people need to do is understand what, what, what the way to, to make money over time. Th this is nothing I made up, okay? But you have to have a diversified portfolio of return streams, right? That's what you need. And that's why people used to get into stock bonds. But now all of a sudden stocks, you know, in particular in 22, that didn't help because we're, we're in that realm, right? of inflation problems, which could hurt both of those things. But it's all about getting in different return streams, which is why you have you have to have your stock long portfolio because over time, the population grows, right? Over time, the money supply grows, right? Um, and over time, we get productivity gains because that's what humans do as, as screwed up as we are over time. So the stock market, therefore, goes up, right? So you have to have that. And then you have to have other return streams that are hopefully not correlated to that, right? Long gold, which has been correlated the last year or so, but over time has not, right? This is how you make other than active trading, which even if you want to be an active trader, that should just be one of the return streams that is not correlated to your long stocks and your long whatever, right? Shouldn't be your whole portfolio. That's the key to all of this, right? non-correlated return streams over time. That's where you want to be, quite frankly.
Oh, fantastic. Jason, wonderful advice. And I really enjoyed the conversation here with you. We definitely have to bring you back and uh, catch up. Uh, you know, lot, lots of macro shocks about to happen here in the next few weeks and months. And uh, really looking forward to how they play out, quite honestly. What what does it mean? What would it look I, like? I, people keep asking, me, what do you think of the election? I say, I think I can't wait for it to be over. Yeah, that too. Absolutely. I'm a little worried what might happen on January 6th, 2025, yes. personally. Um, but other than that, you know... I'm not even, I'm, I'm at the point. I'm old enough now. Bring it on. You know what I mean? Let's, <laughs> let, let's get the revolution going is my whole thing. But I don't think anybody ever, they, people don't really do that. Just like all these people that say they're going to move all the celebrities. Oh, I'm going to move out of the country if Donald Trump wins. Okay. Did you move? No. You didn't. No. It, You're not yeah, going to. A lot of talk. It's the same thing. People just talk, talk, talk. But you know what? You wake up the next morning, you eat your breakfast, you go to work because you got to bring home so that you can put food on your table. Like that, that, that's, <laughs> that's all it is, right? Exactly. Exactly. We're all human. We all got basic needs and we all got to take care of our kids. Absolutely. Jason, where can we find more of your work? How can we follow you? Crowdedmarketreport.com. Fantastic. It's the best awesome. place. And I'll point you to, look, we're on YouTube. I have a video that we do all, we do free videos on YouTube. I do daily videos on YouTube that, I don't know if we charge $10 a month or something like that for people that want that kind of service, but even without that, I do free videos every week where I talk about a lot of different subjects. Um, but check out crowdmarketreport.com and you, you can see what, we're, what what we have there. I think it I think it could help. It, it helps people that are looking for certain things. No, fantastic, Jason. Really enjoyed our conversation. We'll have definitely have to get you back on and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. If you did, it's easy to support us and it's free as well. It's just hit that like and subscribe button. Helps us out tremendously, and we do appreciate that. We also read all the comments. So put your comments down below. What do you think? Um, yes, we can have a discussion about the underlying economy and who's hurting and who's not. But the numbers in th in general don't lie. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. How are you doing? We do want to hear from you. Like all your questions and comments um, really influence our discussion here on SOAR Financially. We're really appreciative of the Clear Commodity Network who's syndicating our uh, podcast here as well. Make sure to check them out at clearcommodity.net and uh, we'll be back with lots more here on SOAR Financially. Thanks so much for tuning in. <laughs>